may finally prove to be the most disastrous floods in the history of New South Wales completely inundated these areas. Rain sheeting down, at one stage almost three inches in an hour, the heaviest June falls in 64 years. Yet Sydney is suffering lightly compared with cities and towns within a hundred miles north and west. Even the plight of home seekers forced to live in tents at nearby Narrabeen is minor tragedy. Elsewhere, whole towns lie under water and homes, not tents, are awash in rushing floods. The freak weather spreads to sea, whipping the ocean into white fury. Colliers, flood-bound and storm-bound, cannot get through with desperately needed coal. In catchment areas, water cascades into dams, fills them and overflows in roaring torrents. There's enough water here to supply Sydney for three years, and as much again pours out to flood the countryside. The Warragamba Dam is transformed into a giant spillway as the irresistible rush of water continues. A thing of beauty, terrifying in its demonstration of power. A man died when he tried to swim the rapidly rising Nepean, one of seven drowned as the flood takes its toll. Windsor is underwater as the Nepean rises 27 feet in a few hours and breaks its banks. This sand and gravel plant is badly damaged and will be out of operation for a long time. Marooned. They have no hope of rescue while human life is still at stake. Cattle and sheep losses cannot yet even be estimated. But in spite of flood and disaster, the dawn will still be ushered in in the traditional manner. Hundreds of homes are damaged, hundreds of people trapped. This man waited a long time for rescue, and he didn't have much to spare. Beneath the water are thousands of acres of vegetables, part of a three million pound crop, lost. Boats are used to save lives and to salvage a few personal belongings. This is all they have left. The rest lies behind them, under the river. It's hard work rowing against the rushing flood, but there's no shortage of volunteers, and they can still have one for the road, even if it is under the water. A culvert on the Windsor Road was swept away as a car crossed it. The car was carried 50 yards, rolling over and over in the raging torrent, yet neither the driver nor his wife was injured. Some roads higher up can still be used, but scores of cars are stalled. A lorry spends the day towing them out of trouble, at ten shillings a time. The road to the north, Wyong, halfway to Newcastle, was swept by floodwaters. All road and rail traffic was completely suspended, but news cameramen got through. The Hunter Valley, a vast waste of water that has brought desolation and death. Probably 10,000 Hunter Valley people, 6,000 in Maitland alone, are homeless and will be homeless for at least a month in what Maitland's mayor describes as the awful calamity the floods have brought. That's Maitland below, a city of 21,000 people, many of whom escaped only with their lives and the clothes they wear, and most of whom are hungry. Cameraman Bede Whiteman got into Maitland on its Black Saturday by car, lorry, army duck, and finally by wading in water up to his neck. His is a dramatic, pathetic story. Maitland Railway Station. The swirling torrent came so fast that trains could not be moved out in time. Rail yards became a choppy inland sea as wind and water conspired in an orgy of destruction. Amphibious ducks, manned by men of the Citizen Army, are rushed from nearby camps to evacuate women and children. They did fine work. Many, caught by the sudden rise of water, stand huddled in doorways, cold and wet. For the youngsters with no responsibilities, the flooded streets are something of a novelty. No use waiting for that pub to open. And when you do get a bottle, there's always the problem of delivery. He's safe now, but he has only eight lives left. Maitland Gasworks, severely damaged by water, will be out of operation for months. 
Police and surf lifesavers from Newcastle and army men do magnificent work in taking people to safety. No praise can be too high for the job they did. The work goes on tirelessly for days with no sleep and little food. For the victims are cold, unprotected, and many are almost starving. Tragedy has no respect for age or illness. At first, victims are evacuated to the town hall, but soon this is threatened by water too, and police decide to take them onto land above the flood level. These people, in a few hours of terror, have lost their all. Even when the flood subsides, their homes will be weakened, caked with mud, their furniture, radios and clothing ruined. In the comparative warmth and safety of the police station, the very young have their first meal for many, many hours. Mothers tend their children, thankful for what they have, trying to forget the nightmare of loss and sorrow they've left behind. This weary man lost all his personal belongings, but he saved his pet cockatoo. With most of Maitland's food destroyed in the flood, supplies have to be rushed in. Federal and state governments made immediate grants. Amphibious jeeps and ducks are loaded with foodstuffs. Bread is sent in to help feed thousands of hungry victims. With all other transport blocked, the RAAF flies in blankets and supplies by Dakota. Fortunately, the weather has broken fine. This is an airlift vital to the lives of thousands of Australians. Down it goes, food, warm clothing dropped onto dry areas. And there's no shortage of volunteers to gather the precious relief. Meanwhile, the slow work of rescue goes on. This woman is taken from her sickbed. For the ill, the aged and the very young are the worst sufferers in this ordeal. Total damage in this worst of all New South Wales floods is still unestimated. Crops are ruined, stock drowned, mines flooded. Seven are dead, and many thousands are homeless. These are refugees, Australian refugees. The things they worked for and hoped for lie buried beneath the muddy water that swirls and eddies around their homes. They wonder what they can salvage from a lifetime of work and saving. Refugees looking back. For that was her home.